and welcome to Indiana Edge. I'm your host, Taylor Whitaker, your guide through today's episode, one of many in an exciting series that will surprise you with stories of individual cities and towns that make Indiana such a unique place. We will uncover the special combination of history, people, and culture that have shaped these places and given them an edge over others, the Indiana Edge. Today, we are traveling to Monroe County, in the south central part of the state to the county seat, the city of Bloomington. Here's a quick view of current city statistics. To begin our discovery of Bloomington, let's visit the year 1816. This was an exciting year, for it was the year Indiana became the 19th state of our United States. Additionally, Bloomington was first settled in 1816 after President James Monroe declared a seminary would be established on the land. The understanding is that it was those early settlers that gave Bloomington its name. We're told that Bloomington was named Bloomington because there were so many wildflowers that bloomed in the area. And that's as much as we know about how Bloomington got its name, but that's what we understand. Indeed, the identity of this haven of blooms was beginning to take shape. And just two short years later, in 1818, the Indiana General Assembly created Monroe County and Bloomington was officially established. And when the county was established in 1818, then the, the town or the city of Bloomington was created that same spring and summer. And in June, they held the auction for the first blocks of 200 properties in the downtown. And that was the beginning of the official city or town of Bloomington. Now those 200 lots or so were sold at public auction. By January 1819, 30 families called Bloomington home and economic growth began with the development of stores, taverns, and industries. There were a handful of industry besides the businesses and then the the mills and so forth that supported the farmers. Um, Austin Seward came and created his uh, company, which made the fish, we're told, that's on top of the courthouse, and they made a lot of iron fences. And we're told he also made iron pots and things that the settlers needed. Then there was a salt works that prepared salt, because that was very needed in the early days for preservation. Of food. While farming, ironworks, and saltworks were certainly essential to early life, trades like timbering and limestone extraction were prevalent and popular as well. In fact, Bloomington is home to some of the finest limestone around. Some of the earliest examples can be found in Covenanter Cemetery, and iconic American structures like the Washington National Cathedral, the Empire State Building, and the Pentagon are all made of Indiana limestone. Oh, and remember that seminary proposed by President Monroe? It was confirmed as Indiana Seminary in 1820. Today, it is Indiana University and built primarily and almost entirely of limestone. Now, when we look at the timbering trade, Bloomington's first courthouse was actually built of logs, and by 1823, a population of 500 people lived in log and frame houses in town. In fact, timbering fostered the development of one of Bloomington's earliest success stories the story of Charles C. Showers and family. Eventually in the 1850s, Charles Showers came and opened his Showers company. His, brother, his sons eventually brought him out after, during and after the Civil War, and they became Showers Furniture Factory in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Like many others, Showers took advantage of the New Albany and Salem Railroad that forged through Bloomington to send in-demand furniture far and wide. By the time his three sons took over the business in 1868, Showers Company was a major industrial complex that covered seven acres, remaining prosperous for generations. So once the railroad came, that made limestone a viable industry. It meant that the little college here that became Indiana University could have more students because they could get here more easily on the train and the furniture could, that Showers Brothers made could be shipped around the country, and eventually it was shipped all over the country. So those three big industries grew and changed after the Civil War. And change they did. By the 1960s, Showers Company had closed due to immense industrial growth and other competitive pressures. And by the late 1980s, Radio Corporation of America, or RCA, which had moved to town in 1940, was bought by General Electric, 
and Bloomington pushed on toward the new millennium. After the break, get ready to examine another unique Bloomington family-owned business that has already made it into the history books, continuing to make Bloomington a destination for innovation. Stay tuned. Hey, Jenna Fuzz, Mike, Trooper Money Slang. Aw, scram. I'm Chris Mike, Jebby Robon. Shaw gonna lead up in Kispet. Peace, Charity, get town down. <laughs> Toot face, dummy way. Brown a brood. What? With the top 100 shows preloaded, huh. Xfinity is perfect for people who want to join the conversation. Catch up on the shows everyone is talking about. Get started with the Xfinity X1 Triple Play from Comcast for $99 a month for a whole year. Call 1 800 Xfinity or visit Comcast.com today. Innovative Group LLC, video and multimedia production, single camera, multi camera, live, post edit, everything. Click wigtv.com. Welcome back to Indiana Edge. I'm your host, Taylor Whitaker. We are ready to jump back into our exploration of Bloomington. We pick up on the heels of the Showers Company Rise and Fall. And it's now 1963, and Cook Group Incorporated has been founded. So the Cook family started the company in 1963, and they did truly have humble beginnings. They started with a $1,500 investment in their business, and they started with three products, catheters, wire guides, and needles. Um, they were manufacturing out of the spare bedroom of their apartment here in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, and that was Mr. and Mrs. Cook. They were the first two employees that we had here. Mr. and Mrs. Cook, of course, is William and Gail Cook, founders of Cook Group Incorporated. Now, while Bill passed away in 2011 at the age of 80, his legacy lives on. Cook and his family have also created a legacy of philanthropy and historic preservation that reaches far beyond Bloomington city limits. One such example of Cook's work in restoration can be seen with the West Baden Springs Hotel and French Lick Springs Hotel in southwestern Indiana. The Monroe County History Center is a great place to visit for more on the family's preservation endeavors. Cook is now the second largest employer in Bloomington behind Indiana University and remains faithful to caring for the community that surrounds it. And fast forward to today and we now have um, a $2 billion company. We are in 135 countries serving over uh, 40 medical specialties and we have over 12,000 employees uh, globally. So we've grown a lot over the years. Mr. Cook once said that one of the best things you can do for someone is to give them a job. And what we found in the community that there was a mismatch between skill set and education and some of the jobs that we were offering here at Cook. Um, so what we require for many of our entry level manufacturing positions is a high school diploma. And when we did research, we found that over 5,000 individuals in Monroe County did not have their high school diploma or equivalent. And so one of the things that we did was try to develop a program where we could offer the ability for people to earn their high school equivalency and work and building to uh, a full-time job. So that's what we've done. We, um, it's really important to always have good partnerships in the community, so we were fortunate to partner with Monroe County School Corporation and Ivy Tech to develop a seven-week program where individuals could come work at Cook part-time and then go to class part-time to help study for their high school equivalency test. Now Katie admits the best part of her job is that she gets to work with a wide array of people that Cook employs or partners with. With such a large employee base, Cook is never lacking in idea and innovation discovery. An empowered employee is one that's going to be successful for the company. And what we've tried to do is find employees within the organization that are passionate about one thing or another. Um, and what we found is we had a lot of individuals that were interested in giving back to the kiddos in the community. And one way to do that was developing a program and partnering with the Boys and Girls Club to offer a tutoring program. And employees were able to volunteer their time uh, to help uh, students study for their homework, help in any ways they can, just to provide a mentorship to these students. And this has been a very successful way for our employees to develop a program and to give back at the same time. 
For more information and history on Cook Group, visit cookgroup.com. And speaking of history, it's certainly not missing from Bloomington's modern landscape. Let's travel to another long-standing family-owned establishment, Nick's English Hut. Yes, Prohibition was 1920 to 1933. So when Nick Hersmalis, um, my original owner, uh, opened this place up, it was there was no alcohol involved whatsoever. And uh, in 1934, January 1934, we got our liquor license. So we're like the second or third longest continuous liquor license in the state of Indiana. Nick's English Hut opened in 1927, smack dab in the middle of Prohibition. So, the Nick's you see and taste today was drastically different in those early years. Well, uh, Nick's English Hut was between the town square and the main campus of Indiana University of Bloomington. So this was kind of a hot spot. There's very uh, residential in this area, so it was like a neighborhood bar. And, uh, but we didn't serve alcohol at the time, so it was more of a, like a soda shop, soda candy cigarette shop. So as the times changed, that little soda candy cigarette shop changed too. So how many seats did we start with? I want to say this first room had... Maybe 70. And then we added another 75. Another, and then another 75, then another 40, and then 200, so. So we're just under 500 seats over 90 years. This place actually grew organically. I mean, there's a lot of places that they try to emulate something like this where they make it look antique or have little quirky rooms or things like that. This is actually what it really is. We, it didn't, there was no formula for this. And so it expanded over the years just out of necessity for extra business. And Mr. Barnes, Dick Barnes, my former partner, was the one that had the vision after he, because he bought it from the Hearst Mollis family. In 1957. And so we did, he kept on expanding, and of course the kitchen never expanded, so it ended up being me coming up with ideas how to make the kitchen more uh, efficient and be able to work. So it's just out of necessity, we, had, we got more rooms and more rooms and went to the building next door, which is where the hump room is, which is one of our big showcase rooms, especially for Indiana University events, football games, basketball games, graduation, things like that. So, it's just a nice place to be. It is certainly easy to echo Greg's sentiments. Whether you are new to Nick's or able to reminisce about the good old days with visions of Nick Hirschmalis himself at the soda machine, or visions of Dick Barnes ushering in fresh pizza from the neighboring The Pizzeria, there's just something about Nick's. I think it's keeping everybody 21 again, because no matter what age you are, when you come back to Nick's, you reminisce those college days when you first left home and were on your own, living it up, and we tried to make people feel that young again, you know. Not many changes have gone on in the bar, and the ones that have gone on have been for the better to modernize facilities, so they do feel that we're taking care of their alma mater, but yet it feels and tastes just like it did when they were 21. So we have 90-year-olds that come in, or we have 22-year-olds, or 50-year-olds with their three-year-old grandchildren. They're all showing us off. Well, the years have been kind to Nick's, as have Susan and Greg. Did you know Greg began working at Nick's in 1978 at just 19 years old? And despite all they've done together already, Greg and Susan have more coming. So, while you anticipate the new, head into Nick's, grab a strom, and reflect on the endless memories that cover those hallowed halls. Stay tuned after the break. We'll take a walk through the Jordan Hall greenhouse for a look into life around the globe. How's it going? Nice to meet you guys. I have these two laptops. We're going to each download a TV show. I'm going to download it on Xfinity, and you guys are going to download it with AT&T UVerse. And we're going to see who goes faster. Go. Well, this is a no-brainer so far. How's AT&T doing? Struggling. I'm ready to go. We'll wait for you guys. Looks like we're going to be waiting for a while. Don't let UVerse slow you down. Upgrade to an Xfinity X1 triple play from Comcast and save when you bundle. See for yourself. Call 1-800-XFINITY or visit Comcast.com today. The only way to get better is to challenge yourself. And that's what we're doing at Xfinity. We are challenging ourselves to improve every aspect of your experience. And this includes our commitment to being on time, every time. That's why if we're ever late for an appointment, we'll credit your account $20. It's our promise to you. We're doing everything we can to give you the best experience possible. Because we should fit into your life, not the other way around. Welcome back to 
to Indiana Edge. We're exploring the city of Bloomington and now taking a turn to the greener things in life from the Jordan Hall Greenhouse. Well, the greenhouses here were built in the mid-1950s along with Jordan Hall, which houses a biology department. Uh, originally, the biology department was split up into uh, other departments like botany, uh, microbiology, zoology, which all merged into one large biology department. And that was, I think, in 1976. So Jordan Hall has been home for the biology department ever since. And the greenhouses have always served as uh, part of what was originally the botany department and now later became plant sciences department and uh, still serves that purpose. In fact, the greenhouse serves many purposes. Students, non-students, residents, and visitors alike will find that it provides serenity during a stressful day and warmth during a cold day. Everyone can take a stroll through the green gardens, fresh flowers, and tropical jungles of thriving, unusual, and exotic plants from around the globe. The greenhouse uh, here on the first floor that's open to the public features plants from a lot of different parts of the world different environments like the desert house that we're standing in now and in addition to that there are a lot of tropical rooms that have plants from a lot of different places and we have uh, we have a collection of uh, insectivorous plants that uh, find different ways of capturing insects to uh, supplement their nutritional needs and just a pretty big variety of things that uh, people can, can view when they come in. Plant sciences uh, are very important, probably never more important than, than today. There are a lot, of, uh, a lot of problems in the world. You know, there's overpopulation. The population of the earth keeps growing more and more. And with increased population, there's more demand for food, for uh, shelter, clothing, energy, all those things that plants provide. Every bit of the food that we eat comes either directly or indirectly from plants. Uh, the houses we live in are built out of plant material. The clothes we are wearing are often made from plant products. Uh, the energy that we use uh, comes either from ancient plants in the form of coal and oil or from renewable plant sources such as ethanol. Uh, 30% of the corn that's produced in the country today is used for ethanol production. It can be uncomfortable to look beyond the surface, beyond the beauty, but it is a necessary education that can only help us to continue to thrive and keep ourselves and our land healthy. You know, there's just so many things we could get from plants. We do get from plants and many more things we could get from plants that we don't even know about yet, perhaps. the. Um, you know, we're losing plants to extinction in places before we even have the opportunity to study them and understand what they could do for us. Rainforests are being uh, destroyed in a lot of places and that's partly to make room for more uh, food production and cattle grazing, you know, along with, like I said, more people need more food, so that's one way they try to solve that problem. But if we could get better at producing uh, pl uh, food more efficiently on the plant, on the land that's already in cultivation, and maybe we wouldn't have to, you know, take, put more and more acreage in cultivation. Lest we forget, the air we breathe, the oxygen we inhale is produced by plants. So, visit the greenhouse, take a deep breath among the plants, feel your lungs inflate, take that feeling with you always, and care for what you've been given. Our next step in the discovery of Bloomington is all about giving. Let's check out Middleway House and see how women, children, and even men are given new life after domestic violence, human trafficking, and sexual assault. A lot of times when people think of Middleway House, they think domestic violence shelter. And we are a domestic violence shelter, but there are so many other services that we provide, and you don't have to be a resident of our shelter to use them. We have legal advocates, um, and our legal advocacy program is one of our largest programs. Last year, I believe it served close to 800 people. Um, we help individuals with protective orders, people who need a divorce, people who just have questions like, I'm in this situation and I'm not sure what to do. I don't understand the court system. Can you explain things to me? 
We don't have a licensed attorney working, but our legal advocates are there and they can help with the protective orders. They can help file the divorce papers. They can go and sit with somebody in court, which can be huge because when you think about domestic violence, there's so much isolation and they may not have anybody who's sitting in court with them and to have somebody who is there for you, who's reminding you that somebody cares can mean a whole lot. Deborah's passion for this organization and those it serves is so evident when talking with her. What may not be as clear is how her own personal story has roots in Middleway. I was a client here. I ended up living in the transitional housing program with my kids for two years. I started going to college while I lived there and then transferred to ISU when I moved out. But I remember when I first connected with Middleway House and what amazed me is no one told me what to do. They asked me what I wanted to do and for me, I was used to people telling me what to do and a small part of me wanted them to tell me what to do because I wasn't used to making decisions for myself. But the encouragement that they gave me to start making decisions for myself and I ended up graduating with a degree from ISU in criminal justice and I was working with incarcerated women and I was realizing how many of them were in their a situation because oftentimes addiction issues go along with domestic violence with individuals self-medicating and um, I was making a lot of referrals back to Middle White House and when a job came open for community service coordinator somebody said you should apply for that and for me it was going so full circle to come back to an agency I love to be co-workers with, with people that I admired so much and you know, and to like pinch myself a whole lot to think I'm actually like equal to them because once you're a survivor of domestic abuse, there's always this little part of you. <laughs> there's always that little part that sneaks up on you sometimes that makes you feel like you're not quite good enough. And then to end up after the hiring process, getting the job as executive director, I think that truly shows what Middle Way House does for people. I am just one story, but all over this community, there are individuals who have stories similar to mine, who where Middleway House has made such a huge impact and a huge difference in their lives that they're living a life they never thought was possible. Middleway House is not just a destination for the after, after assault, after violence. It's a destination for education and prevention as well. But our prevention program to me, that is so, so vital. When we're looking at the fact that we could continue doing this crisis work forever, but I hope we don't have to. I hope someday this work does not have to be done. And prevention programs are the only thing that can lead us to that point. So we have our prevention program goes into the middle school and the high schools, works with a lot of youth service organizations and any type of group that wants to know, wants us to come in and we educate about what a healthy relationship is because so many people grow up and they have no idea of what a healthy relationship is. Now my ultimate goal is to see that expand into the elementary school ages and preschools because it's never too early to start learning about what healthy relationships are. Whether you are starting a family, entering a new relationship, or starting over after an experience that has left some scars, Middle Way House can help you put the right foot forward. Besides our crisis line and our legal advocacy service, we're also a rape crisis center. Um, we have on-scene advocates. If somebody has experienced sexual assault or domestic violence and they're at the hospital, somebody can come and be with them and help them know that they have a right to make choices for themselves. We are an agency that works on empowerment and it's very important to us that what we do is give people the information. We know that everybody knows their life best and we let them make the decisions that they feel are best for them in that moment with the information and resources we provide. We have transitional housing, which is a two-year program for individuals who have experienced domestic abuse. We have an extensive youth program. We put a lot of resources into our kids and that after-school program has tutoring, mentoring, a lot of activities. We have a lot of great students from IU that come and volunteer daily in that program. We have a licensed child care on site so that individuals who are living in our shelter or our transitional housing program can have good 
childcare that they can feel comfortable leaving their kids in a safe place while they're going to school or looking for a job. There are many sources of hope in life. Let Middleway House help. If you or someone you know is in trouble, call the crisis hotline today to connect with someone. The crisis hotline number is 812-336-0846. When we return, we wrap up our tour of Bloomington by seeing what your neighbors are saying about the city. Stay tuned. This is the dawn of an old day because AT&T and DirecTV are offering yesterday's technology today. TV from space. Space. As long as it's not too rainy. Rainy. Or windy. Windy. Or there isn't a branch in the way. Branch. Welcome to the moment no one's been waiting for. The fastest internet and the best TV experience is already here with X1, only from Xfinity. So what is it this time? Now it's the snow? It's the snow this time? You know, we're missing the game. I can't even look at you. Don't let satellite ruin your entertainment. Get Xfinity, and you'll enjoy a reliable TV signal inside, no matter what the weather's like outside. Look who's on the roof again. Oh. Invite him over. Yeah. Switch to Xfinity TV from Comcast for $19.99 a month for 12 months with no term contract. Call 1-800-XFINITY or visit Comcast.com today. We're back. You're watching Indiana Edge. We are focusing on some of the most unique aspects to the city of Bloomington. Let's see what your neighbors are saying. The local people here are very like open-minded. They have their own unique ideas and bring their own different perspectives. And so I feel like even though Bloomington could be like a small place, you can still learn a lot from all the different people that are here. My mom is from Ghana and she came here from Ghana to go to Indiana University. So I find that I can meet a lot of other people that are also Ghanaian and it's a different variety of people. So I can meet people who are from the same place my family's from. One of the things that I really enjoy about Bloomington is that it uh, it has the content of a bigger city, the culture of a bigger city, while still being relatively comfortably sized. It's not packed full of people. Um, it's easy to get around public transportation. Bloomington is so unique because we, even though we're in the heart of the Midwest, we have a little bit of the southern uh, Indiana draw, but we also have the culture of IU, and that just blends so beautifully together because Midwesterners are so nice, and then you have the culture from IU, but you also just have people who are very supportive of small businesses, and I've just seen that time and time again here, and I love the fact that they think local before they look at larger markets or anything like that, and that's why I think our downtown thrives. I think when we have special events, people are very supportive of that. That's why Bloomington has so many nonprofits as well, because people are very active in the community. Well, he had the uh, only intelligent answer, so go ahead. Uh, I just really like how all the people are just so nice in Bloomington. Head to visitbloomington.com to plan your outing in Bloomington today. Here are some things to mark on your calendar year over year. Thanks for watching this episode of Indiana Edge. I'm Taylor Whitaker. We'll see you in the next city.